I want to introduce a new week because I'm very excited about this week. It's probably my favorite out of the series. As Nadia opened up yesterday about what we've done thus far, we've spent a lot of time on community. We've explored creative culture and we did some uh, learning, so to speak, about creative work. But this week, I think, really grounds and underpins everything because we're focusing on purpose specifically. And, you know, purpose obviously envelops and opens all that we do and encapsulates all the work that we try to engage in. But it is um, an elusive concept, to say the least. It's hard to really pin down and point to. So I'm very much looking forward to this conversation because we have a genius and a very uh, respectable creative in our midst who might actually give us some sort of direction into how we can define it. So I'll begin by allowing you to introduce yourself, Jinria, and then we'll get into some lines of questioning. Okay. Hey, everyone. <laughs> My name is Jinria Miran Um I'm a creative. I'm also an entrepreneur. So in the realm of creativity, I do different things. Um, could be poetry, writing, um, music, different things. Yeah. Yes. Can you can you let us know a bit more about your entrepreneurial pursuits? Because they're no small endeavor. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. So I own like a, um, a clothing brand, and um, with the clothing brand, you know, our mission has always been to educate the world about the Afrocentric background. You know, like when. I came to this country, to the United States, I found out that the, you know, like the way the media painted our Afrocentric culture and, you know, like things relating to it, you know, it was very skewed and very flawed. So I always had at the back of my mind that I'm going to own something to help change that narrative. And then my sisters and I, we started Dashiki Pride. So with that, we've been able to start up a dialogue because when you see a cloth right you're like where did you get that from you're like oh you know nigeria and you know like you start having good dialogue and that creates you know like a transfer of um you know like a good change narrative so i'm i'm glad that we've been able to do that yeah i love this this is a great point to begin kicking off the conversation because i think narratives often interwoven with um, purpose. You know, Mark said something yesterday in our chat that stuck with me and that we are ultimately at our core um, narrative based, almost literary based, and that we like to base our life and our perspectives and lenses on the world through stories and storytelling. And so I want to first ask you how you define purpose in your life and in your world, and how does that connect to some of the work you've been getting into? So I believe that purpose is that machine or the motor that drives you. It's that thing, realm that makes you, that motivates you to keep going. It's that being you that breathes in life because for everything we do in this world, right? You have to, everyone has a purpose. And if you don't have that thing that you wake up to, or that you want to put all your passion in, or you want to use your passion to drive, you feel empty. So purpose to me is like the reason why we live, is the reason why we wake up with a, a drive to do something. So just unpicking that a bit, especially through the perspective of your lived experience, would you say that purpose is more outcome oriented or process oriented and uh, I'll be a bit more clear with my question here you know I think we 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 hold purpose as this like end goal this place that we need to go towards or achieve but I I, I liken it to a dog chasing a car like if we were to actually achieve our purpose what would that mean for us is it more about the experience of chasing that is meaningful or are we actually trying to get somewhere? I feel it's both. I think they're intertwining to each other. So there has to be a start at the origin. And then which makes you, you know, there has to be that beginning point. There's a genesis before the revelation. So, there, mm. so the 
middle ground, right? It's like you it could be, you're not discovering it yet. For everyone that has been born into this world, there is a purpose right from the time you were birthed. But it's just that, again, there's that middle point that, and that's when you're saying that, you know, like the outcome, that's the revelation part. So there's a genesis, right? I feel like as though a lot of humans, a lot of us have gone through that phase. I think everyone has, right? Where you, you don't, you're not sure, you feel it. From when you were a baby, you feel it, right? But then you're lagging, at it, you're confused. You don't know which one it is, do you get? So that's the process, do you get? So yes. keep redefining it, you define it, you, 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 you touch it, then you keep shaping it. You keep yes. making it, make meaning to you. Then when you have it, the whole image, you know, like when it becomes a tangible thing to you, then you can now make it, you know, like into like a manifestation, which is the revelation of it. So yes. I, I, believe, I feel like as though it's a whole, it's it's all together yes i love that uh, what a what a elevating transcendental idea to to uh <laughs> compare it to genesis and revelation and so th there's there's an assumption in there which i love that you introduced and in that again as i was saying before purpose hovers above us as this thing that isn't necessarily um in what we wear and how we we mold things through our hands, but it's, it's just almost, it's very idealistic is what I'm trying to say. So in my own view of the subject, I, I, there's almost this like um, separation I create between big purpose, like big P and small purpose, where it's, it's much more discreet and less um, fantastical. And it's like me saying that I'm going to have a good day today or me saying that I'm gonna complete a task. So the, the area I want to go next in with you is how does the small P of you showing up, running a business, doing your poetry, um, being a community la leader, um, lend itself to your big purpose, like the, the revelation as you speak? And how do you prioritize the, the things you do on the day-to-day -day in relationship with that bigger purpose? Mm -hmm. That's a good question. Okay, so for me, right, um, my, the big picture, the big, you know, manifestation of all I want to do is to put positivity into the world. I want to be able to heal people. I want to be able to give goodness to the world, right? Mm -hmm. So with my business, so I wake up today and I'm like, you know, what fabric can we put out there to put more knowledge into the world? It, um, an example of that is the Samakaka. Um, you know, like you find pieces of that in South Africa and, you know, um, and like countries in, in like Africa, people weren't really, it wasn't prevalent in our society until we started using it. We made it, we popularized it, jig it. And people started asking questions because some people are like, I love the way the print it is. It's like a red, white, you know, like print. All of a sudden, everyone is using the samakaka in the production. You get, do you see like, so imagine me waking up and like, what's the next print to go, <laughs> to go global? What's the next print for someone to wear? And, you know, like feel like they're still get connected to their roots. People stopped wearing dashikis after the 60s and 70s when the, um, the Black Panther, when they matched with it. People forgot the essence of that, um, the dashiki shirt. Mm. We revived it. And, you know, like we made it cool. We reminded people now people are asking more questions every day you know like a lot of people are like oh my child is wearing this my child looks up to you guys or looks up to be able to glow and this kind of print that's that's so huge to be able yes. to help someone's life like that so every day i'm waking up like ah, doing this you know i have to make sure like this sells and this um, goes through and with my poetry and my other creative work the same notion you know, like mm -hmm. i want to about the injustices going on. Um, like look at what's going on in our in, in the United States right now. You know, I've been able to put that into my work. I've been able to, you know, like let people be able to express their thoughts that maybe they couldn't formulate. You know, like sometimes we have thoughts trapped in our mind, but we don't mm -hmm. just have the avenue, we don't know how to form it. So I've been able to put it together and people have been able to relate to that and they're like, thank 
thank you so much, Junior. Like, thank you. I've been able to, you know, like touch my thoughts through your words. Yes. Or been able to spread awareness. Like, what are you doing? Get up, raise your voice up. I've been able to do that. So again, it all ties down to that big picture of healing and putting a good positive, you know, like energy to the world. Yes, yes. I love that as an idea. How important it is to bring the abstract into the concrete through your work and make it manifest. I, I think there's a theme I want to eventually interweave into our conversation with actualization. I think as a thinker and as a and as a creative and as a businesswoman, you are very good at actualization. And um, I think a lot of our relationship with purpose becomes skewed with how far the distance between actualization um, from where we sit currently and where our high level big P purpose sits. And so I, I like that you introduced that, but there's another thing I wanna dive into because I want this to get much more complex in um, exploring purpose and morality. And so you're speaking about uh, how, you know, in light of all the recent events, like we, we can literally choose from a million right now. Um, there's, there's something about the world, the injustices of the world that you can, um, you can reflect on and introduce into your actual work and bring the conversation forward, so to speak. But what, what would you say about the relationship between purpose and morality? Is purpose essential to morality or does it stand almost adjacent to? So with that, you know, like, it could be independent of each other. Because I was mm -hmm. raised, then it could have influences. Your morality can influence your purpose. Let's say, you know, you're raised in a Christian home. Mm -hmm. and you've always been taught to speak of for injustice. So you might find yourself only caring about that and that could drive your purpose. Mm -hmm. So I, I believe where you're standing that for, it's a good, this is a very, very good question. Cause when I, I made sense that when you were born, it's, I, I spoke about purpose like as though it was innate. Mm -hmm. This is actually a good question to ponder about. <laughs> <laughs> but this is a good one though, no, this is a good one. Because now I can, I'm thinking myself right now, I'm thinking, hmm, what if, you know, like my teachings and what my parents taught me shaped my purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Because what if, if I was raised in a family that didn't really, you know, like I didn't believe in God or I didn't believe, which is, you know, like everyone, we were all raised differently. Would I still have the same purpose? So I feel like as they actually, it could influence purpose. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It could influence purpose because when I think about it now, it's just like knowing that there's something called a general good, right? So whether yes. you're born Christian, whether you're born into any kind of family or whatever your teaching is, there's a general good. So I think that's also what purpose is. It's just that mm. morality can influence the way you decide to carry it out. Mm. I, I'm going to make this even more difficult for you. But before I do, I want to invite Nadia, Evan, or Mark to chime in thoughts here. Uh, just... Well, just so we can give you a bit of time to uh, process the ridiculousness of my questions. Oh. <laughs> um, right. First of all, um, again, we, we thank you. Well, thank you so many times throughout this call, but I'll, I'll take my opportunity to thank you for holding this space for us. It's even been such a short, great experience so far. Um, so I think the way that I look at that stuff, like um, I see morality being behind purpose. Um, I don't see it being necessarily a one-to-one -one linear relationship where morality will define your purpose maybe more so on like levels and i say levels it might be judgmental to say you know when what i consider good morals and and you know high high level of morality versus a low level of morality um but i mean if i were to apply my own lens yeah i see it in that way that you know your purpose will be drawn from whatever level of morality you hold if you think mm -hmm. about someone whose purpose is um, mm -hmm. negative money driven you know, you think about the morals that they have compared to someone who's community and family driven, right? It kind of guides you to what kind of purpose that, that you'll have. You'll have people who fall through those cracks, but yeah, I think it's, I think that's the direction it goes in. Hmm. 
Mark, Evan, are you are you gonna jump into the boiling water? Oh Lord. Um, <laughs> yeah, um first of all, um thank you guys for like you know having a wonderful discussion thus far. And um thank you for posing such a hard and difficult question. <laughs> um I think in this regard, I am in line with Nadia. Because I think before you know yourself as a self, you know, you're thrown into this world without, um, without you know, any sense of meaning in our direction. And I think that meaning in our direction that we're speaking of today is initially supplied by your social circumstances. Mm -hmm. You know, so, so um, your, mor your morality then informs what you're going to do in the future, you know, and I think um, if, you're, if you're drawing purpose or if you're drawing meaning from, if you're going to draw meaning any at all, you're going to have to do it in a social setting. You know? So in, in that sense, meaning is already supplied to you. If you're essentially, I, I, when I think about purpose, I think about um, creating yourself. Mm -hmm. you know? And I think um, in order to create yourself, in, in um, you know, to create yourself most of the times, what you're going to do is that you're going to draw elements of yourself from your surroundings. You know, so that moral framework must have been there initially before you could have like, you know, drawn the elements necessary to create yourself. So I think morality or, or your moral story precedes your, um, your story of meaning. Mm -hmm. yes. Yes, um, I just want to say hi, and also thank you for being here with us. Um, Stefan always puts us in these places. <laughs> where nobody wants to go first. <laughs> um, but I feel, I think I'm aligned with the both of you. I think we create meaning, and we come into a space where meaning is already been created so we have to shuffle through and like decide which of these things we want to ascribe to or align ourselves with and then through that process we go about create creating our own meaning for ourselves right because there's things are meaningful people have created or have defined things as meaningful but I think as you go on you start to see your own self as something that could have meaning. And through that meaning, you create this ideal, coin this purpose. Um, and again, I, even, even, even talking about it, I, I'm creating, <laughs> it doesn't feel like it's right either. It feels like, it feels like anything could be right. Um, and that, there could be a purpose before, um, and I'm just not too sure. I think, I think this is a great conversation, and <laughs> the other, I, I, I'm really open to hearing someone argue the other side, um, because that's where I am at right now, or that's the limits of my thoughts right now. Well, that's a good as segment as any, because the next question that I had for you, Chidra, is what would it look like to have a wrong purpose? Can we ever? Sorry, did I cut off for a second? Yeah. yeah. So uh, the end part of that was, what would it look like to categorize something as the wrong purpose? Because almost all of you, if not all of you said something about rightness, like, and rightness is associated with your moral framework, right? But what, how would we know when we've arrived at a wrong purpose? So we could, you know, like have a wrong purpose, but some people have vengeance in their heart. Hmm. And they believe it's their purpose to put harm into the world. They just want to harm other people. So when you see, I thought everyone, unless the person has a mental problem, you know, like, and they cannot think themselves, or like, People that can think correctly in the right direction that decide to have, you know, like just a negative purpose, 
they know it's a negative thing. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Again, we are conscious. So that morality you're talking about, like I believe morality helps, you know, like you know, shifts self conscious. And you definitely know when you're exacting harm upon someone else, no matter what teachings you had when you were younger or what you've come about in life, you definitely know when you're hurting someone. So yes, people do have that, you know, and they could have influences from the trauma that they, um, that they saw when they were growing up. So it depends. You know, sometimes they manifested it on their own and sometimes they have influences that shape that negative So I'm going to take a moment to reflect on this too and not just ask questions and say that when I, in my own thought space, explore this, um, I haven't arrived somewhere that I think is concrete enough to share somewhere else. I, I think I'll go back to what you're just saying in that it's it's subjective or it's this experience of subjectivity that um, aligns me to my purpose. It's It's not something that I can outsource again and thus... It is moral in a way because uh, I do believe that morality, again, is a subjective experience, but I don't think it's even useful to draw and create a framework of what is good purpose or what is bad purpose outside of your personal experience. And from there, another line of thinking I'd like to introduce is maybe bad purpose is actually purposelessness. Um, it's it's to disengage from or um, detangle yourself from the responsibility of finding purpose. But then I go back on myself again because I say, why why wouldn't we allow someone to exist without purpose? That that sounds like another thing that we're just forcing people to do. Like, um, you know, people should be okay to follow their heart, right? Just like lean into the moment and to uh, allow that to be the truth that governs them but there's something about that that feels a bit dirty and and like icky to me instead of um something that i would share with someone that i was mentoring for example like i want to say uh sure like go forward without purpose and follow your heart but also try not to do that as much as you can so i guess if we were if i were to put that into a point of reflection or a question i'd say do you think it's necessary for us to create space for purposelessness? Yeah, I, and that, that's, you know, I, I believe that goes into that middle ground I was telling you about. Like, we shouldn't force that and, oh, you have to, that, that's like you trying to force someone, you have to graduate at this time, you have to do this. You know, that's you trying to push your own timing upon someone's purpose. Maybe that person's lifeline was to make mistakes and that mistake um, is supposed to shape their purpose. Did you get? So mm-hmm. I don't believe. Mm-hmm. I mean, we should get, tell people about it. You know, like we should not let someone just die. I, I, and I call it death because when you exist without purpose, it's a type of death that is eternal. Mm. It's a type of death that is eternal because you don't. You, you're living in a box of stagnation and it would be unfair if I know that purpose drives my life and I don't tell that to another person but then again I'll tell them you know keep trying keep working you know like to define what purpose is for you I cannot make it for you you can um, define it yourself and you can find it but I feel like as though we have to have a guideline towards the way we speak about it to people yes let them know about it Yes, such a beautiful thought. Ben, so, oh, oh, sorry, I didn't want to. No, no, go, 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 go. I wanted to do a quick thought um, because you brought up something really interesting. And it was like, does purpose need to be, um, I guess, defined by the individual? Like, do I, have to, do I have to be cognizant of my purpose for it to count as purpose? Or does that make sense? Or can I be like living my life purposelessness? All right, without a purpose and that is purpose. Does that make sense? Like, yes. Do I have to say, I feel like at least now in this time that I'm living in, I've never heard so much people talking about the idea of purpose. Before yes. it was around, we were talking about goals or maybe we're just saying like, these are the things that you should go do in your life. And you're like, that's what I want to do. But 
I think it's interesting what you brought up and say like purposelessness and being stagnant. And I was thinking, I'm like, what about those people? And I would, I would actually, before I go on, like ask you, what do you mean a stagnant life would be? And like, what, what do you define as that? That's the question. That's the legal word, that's specific one. For me? Specific, you said it. Yeah, okay. Yeah, like us. So a stagnant life is you waking up, not doing anything. Like you wake up with no drive, you're not doing absolutely, you're just living. When I mean living, I mean like biologically living, just breathing air. You know, like that's a stagnant life. Julia, and a lot of people, like you say, some people live their life, but they've already discovered their purpose, but they don't term it purpose. You have a drive, you, there's something you like doing, and you're passionate about it. You don't have to call it purpose for it to be actually purpose. So some people might actually mm -hmm. be living their lives, but they're actually living in their purpose. Mm -hmm. Until maybe they meet a, a life coach or something, or they go for a seminar, and they're talking about purpose, and you think to yourself, aha, uh -huh, I've actually been doing this. I, I feel, you know, like someone that is actually living a fulfilled life has a purpose. They might not term it purpose, but they're actually living in their purpose. Yes. Yet, a stagnant life is you waking up and doing absolutely nothing. And you can see that those type of people actually have like a difficult time existing in this world because mm -hmm. everyone is moving with purpose. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. or moving in it has i feel like as a purpose even when you start at it it's still your purpose until mm -hmm. you reach to the revelation part from the genesis you're already tapping into it so it has levels to get mm -hmm. so some people might be at the middle but they're still living a fulfilled life and some people might be you know they got it they're already they're like boom boom like they're already at the top level so i feel like mm -hmm. there's a different level to it when you have nothing at all your, your gas is empty can move. <laughs> That's it. That's it. So I, sorry, Mark, go ahead. So, so, um, so like throughout this conversation, purpose has been referred to as something which drives the individual. So I'm wondering if, <clears throat> if anything else, if it is an instinct, like a biological drive, you know, something that the individual needs in order to be healthy. Uh, I think that's the question I was going to get to. Mm -hmm. like, can someone else, like, can something else give you, like, that purpose? So, like, the environment, does that make sense? Like, mm -hmm. to survive, you, you need to, humans, millions of years ago, you had, the environment made us do certain things. Like, right. We cognitively would have thought about purpose this way, but our purpose was to survive, right? I feel like that's the thought you're going down, Mark. Yes. Yeah, it's, it's akin to that. Um, yeah, I, I think um, in, in older societies, what happens is that like your meaning was applied for you. You know, your meaning was quite mm -hmm. self-evident. It was your family, it was your tribe. Um, and it was actualizing whatever, um, whatever your religion um, dictated that you should actualize. And um, I think in our society, and most modern society, you don't really, you don't really have that outside supply of meaning. I think you have to go out there and engage in the world for yourself and find what your meaning is, find what drives you, find what makes you alive more than anything else. And um, I think that's why these days you can easily find people who are having a crisis of meaning. Because mm -hmm. it's not supplied anymore, it has to be found, so to speak. I, so, oh, no, 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 you go, you go. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was just going to add to what he was saying in the sense of, you know, can the universe or biologically, can we be working on some type of other drive? And what I just wanted to say is that, um, <clears throat> you know, like when you live in a house, you have to pay your bills, right? Like if you, you, you get what I'm saying, like you have to eat. So with that, when I use, let me use work, working, as, a, as an example. So you might have a job that you don't like, but you're working at it and you're living a fulfilled, um, fulfilled life, you're making money to meet um, your ends with. What I'll term that is that you're working on another person's purpose. So you could be doing that job and you will not be happy, but your, your life is not stagnant. 
because you 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 have you have a purpose you're working on, but it's not yours. So you wouldn't feel happy. You wouldn't feel internally like internally fulfilled. You get the, your boss or the person that created that job will feel happy because that's his purpose. So you could be working on another person's purpose. <laughs> yeah. That sounds like. The, like a beautiful dilemma that we've all found ourselves in in the modern world and uh so let me take a moment and ground the conversation a bit because i'm fearful we're just going to scare everybody away with all this like high flown chat and ask and take a corner and ask do would you feel as though success without purpose so monetary professional um, even personal development success is so success without purpose. Would you feel like that's just a sophisticated form of failure? Success <laughs> without <laughs> because we, we we're kind of saying that that um, without a driver, we're just doing things and doing things without rhyme or reason is um, a distraction or maybe even a distancing yourself from a purpose. Um, it, it's almost as if you're foregoing the responsibility of having to earn one. And so I'm just wondering if you getting, you staying busy and getting stuff done on earth, um, however success is defined under that idea is really just you, um, failing in style it might be it might be all right because like one of one of, like one of the most i think one, one of the most um the most fundamental things that you're faced with as a human being is like um being aware mm -hmm. that you're alive being aware that you're in this strange situation wherein you're conscious of your surroundings, you're, you know, you're self-aware and, and all of that goodness. And I think what comes with being self-aware is asking yourself why you're self-aware. What is the meaning of being self-aware? And um, if you're not facing that question as, long, as, as you go through life, it might very well be that you're foregoing one of the most important important um, you're not walking down one of the most important avenues of life and in a sense you're purposeless so it, it might be you might be you might be um walking futilely if that makes sense mm -hmm. Genera, any any thoughts oh okay um for that i would say what who defines failure like because when we're talking about that, success might not be success for, the, I mean, the way I define success might not be the way another person defines success. I might not have the material things of this world and I could be living in my purpose, you know, just going around preaching to people and I feel successful. But someone that lives in a mansion and drives the latest cars might say you're just a failure. But to me, it's not a failure. I'm happy. So I feel like as though, they could, I mean, there could be um, derivatives that could influence that whole idea because who actually defines purpose? I mean, not purpose, success other than the person, you know, living that life. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I wanted to add one thing and you said it by mistake, but I've been thinking it this whole time. It's kind of why I've stayed quiet is like, we're looking at purpose through the definition of, um, we're very like-minded, I think for the most part as a group, like we're all landing on a lot of the same thoughts and feelings. Um, but I think it's important to underscore that considering that the definition of purpose is a lot broader than what we're defining it by, um, where we could be comparing it and likening it to a certain feeling and other people may not have that same feeling that we're likening it to. Um, so, I mean, that I wanted to, to say first, but, and then, yeah, the exact same point is, you know, that the definition of success and failure is something that we have to also take from certain lens. You know, if we're talking about success, um, you know, we can, we ourselves within this group can call success something specific. We can say monetary, we can say spiritually, we can say, um, you know, so many different, so many different definitions of, of success. Um, but then we have to again consider to, to say that to have success without purpose, you said is, is actually failure. 
um, then we would have to understand what, you know, why did somebody ultimately feel as though that's what brought them success? Is purpose really the root of their success? If to them it's money, period, with nothing following, they don't need purpose. They just want, you know, it could be greed. It could be driven by so many things and they could have achieved that. And to them, is that failure? To them, no. To them, that's absolutely where they want to be and where they need to be. I think to us collectively, we understand that, you know, we want to be somewhere for a reason. We want to have chosen where we're at and done it the way that we've done it because mm. it's a purpose and we're, we're like in that mind, but. <laughs> yes, yes. Brilliant thoughts. Evan, anything before we move on? I think I keep, I keep learning every time. Every time both of you speak, both Nadia and Mark, I, you bring me back, <laughs> you bring me back to the middle. And I'm very much in the idea that we, we create, we define, we've already used our words and our ideas to define what purpose is. Like we've created it. So that means I can also, so I can go towards something and work towards something and define something as my purpose. But knowing that I've defined this as my purpose and I've found it, that also means that I can also change it. Like it's always changing. I would have argued that my purpose was something else five years ago. And just understanding that is like, it, it will always change. And then I, I think to Mark's point, I think it was Mark or Nadia, but just like my, my purpose or my drive or my whatever is to continue to grow. It is to continue to discover it is, or to ultimately fail and to gain new things and continue to move forward because through my failures and through my quote unquote successes that I define as successes, I will create my own path on per on that path of purpose. So I think it goes back to all all the way to the beginning. What Stefan was talking about is purpose a process, and I think that's where I'm sitting, and rather a destination. Um, mm -hmm. And that is, yeah, I think I think that's where I'm at right now because um, I'm being stretched right now. I don't like it. <laughs> <laughs> well, to be honest with you, I think we're digging through a lot of gray right now it's it's only been like 40 minutes of conversation like this is such a complex abstract thing that we throw around and throw on to people like we always especially in north american western ideology we keep pushing purpose as the ultimate mode of existence but we we can never follow up with the next sentence of what we actually are expecting from the person when we say that and so um I just want to turn the corner and make this a bit more palatable and digestible and ask Chidre if you can comment on a bit about your identities. So I think identity salience is a core driver of how we experience the world. So I'm a black dude from Canada. Those, those three things really shape and form the, the way I approach my world and what I find and prioritize within my world. Um, I'm wondering with the identities that mean something to you, how does that, what, what's the relationship with those, like with how you formed and experienced purpose? Yeah, that's a good one. So it actually has like a big influence on your purpose because, um, you know, like the Syrian culture can have a unified purpose that they push onto, you know, the younger ones growing up. Like for me, I was born in Nigeria and, you know, like they would tell you, you're going to be a doctor, you're going to be an engineer. Like they didn't even want you to even think or formulate any way for any path for yourself. So, you know, I didn't even get to touch or figure, I mean, I feel like as though that underlying purpose was still beneath whatever my culture was trying to form for me. But mm. even with that, you know, I've always had that passion to, put positivity into the world to heal and things of that sort. But then again, you know, like my culture was trying to shape my identity. But then at 13, I left Nigeria. Then I met another culture over here. Mm -hmm. So it's like, there was a clash, do you get? Because I came mm -hmm. from a country where everyone is black. There was nothing like racism. Rather, it was more tribalism. You get, and then I'm hearing the word races. I didn't even know what the word was. 
I've never had that in my dictionary. I was like, what do you mean you don't like me because of the color of my skin? Like what, in fact, what does this mean? And then there was a disconnect between the African-Americans and the Africans. So the African-Americans were making fun of me still. So I was so confused. So my identity was just spinning around. <laughs> Who are you? What's going on? You know, you were in this country and you know, they were, you know, you're a good black woman and now you're here. And not only are the people that look like you making fun of you, the whites, they're, you know, like they're discriminating against you too. So, you know, like I, you know, it's a process. I had to hold on to what I learned back home, honestly. Mm. I had to, because back home, we were raised to have tough skin. Yeah. So I had to hold on to that tough skin and, and say, Whatever it is I experience, I'll take the good parts to attach my identity. I'm not going to forget that purpose that is within me that I have to reach to the top. Mm. Do you get? And then in my culture, they've always said you have to make sure you're part of the, you know, like you're one of the best. You can't do wrong. You can't do this. I mean, it, it, it could affect a person, honestly, because you just want to be good. You want to always do good. You cannot fail. So they don't even give you an option to experience that process you spoke about earlier. Like, no, the purpose is right there. It's, you have to be one of the greatest. You have to achieve greatness. And you know, do you get what I'm saying? Yeah. So, you know, like in, in America here, I saw kids failing and no one was doing anything to them. And, you know, they were in, in, like, in schools in Nigeria, you became, if you get questions wrong or, you know, you don't do well. And people over here were getting F, like some people were getting straight F. <laughs> Nothing was going on. Like the parents were not doing anything. I was like, oh my goodness. So I now had to, you know, like shape myself. I feel like I thought I became the driver of my own identity. You know, like some people actually have that subconsciously formed for them. But for me, I feel like I was in the forefront, like selecting so like people like that. Do you get but as I was building it up, and it takes a strong front to be able to do that. I mean, that's for my life, you get, because of the different experiences I've, you know, like been in. I went from an all black school, African American school, you know, when I was in eighth grade. Then in my high school, I went to an all white school. So I faced discrimination of different sorts from my people that look like me and the ones that don't look like me. But I was still able to form my identity, and not everyone can do that. I, 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 I'm, I'm, again, I'm speaking for myself. You know, it could have destroyed someone's identity. It could have made them lose that purpose that we we're speaking about. It could have made them remain in that process of trying to find out, you know, like who they are. Because again, you come from loving your color to thinking that there's something wrong with your color. And you come from feeling that you have to be one of the best to thinking, oh, well, you can fail. You don't have to always be the best. You come from always going by authority because in my country, you mainly, they teach you to go by authority. You know, like what your teacher says is true. To so coming over mm -hmm. here and questioning your teacher, like having the audacity to question your teacher. It's like, you know, like it's, it's, it's confusing for a child. So I was able to pick, up, you know, like pick that up and shape it myself. Not everyone can do that. And I, because, I, you know, I have siblings and I see how that affected my younger one. So, you know, like when we speak about this, it could vary depending on the person. Because again, people are different. Our emotions can have something, our biological state, the emotional brain can have a way to actually affect this whole purpose and identity that we're all speaking yes. about. Yes. Because if someone were to be more, um, you know, like, I don't, know to, I don't know the perfect word to put, like more softer, like they might have been destroyed by all that. So mm -hmm. I would say that really depends on how a person decides to push through the world and its experiences, you know, to hold your purpose, regardless of what, you know, like the life or, or, or whatever life is putting at you, you know, things mm -hmm. like that. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Uh, so what you've just done and gotten to by the end of the hour is what I hoped we'd magically achieve. And so this is, 
it's always easier when you're speaking to geniuses because they ultimately um, reveal what you want them to reveal. And that basically what we've all been saying in so many words, what we've been hovering around is that purpose is, and the process of creating are almost so interwoven that they're the same thing. That purpose and existing in a creative way is not, is in almost always and all facets the same thing. It's because we are constantly taking in outside stimuli, direction, information, knowledge, um, putting them through our own personal filter and lenses and experiences and moving forward. And that's that there, that, that space is purpose. And so what, what I guess I want to get into and aside from just plugging this series of embodiment is like, how do we think about the, the ways in which living in a creative way and embodying purpose are a, a modality to move forward into. It, it's almost a blueprint that people can draw from with how they live their life purposefully. Does that question make sense at all? Yeah, it does. Wait, oh, should I answer first or? Sure, sure. <laughs> oh, <okay>. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, we, you know, with your creative way, what if someone is not creative? Do we not define? I I'm thinking about it, right? I'm like, you know, are you just asking specifically for creative people? Because not everyone can create in that sense. People, you know, are different. That's the right. Just creative purpose. Like if you're, if you actually want to, um, if you want to get into the creative space, is that what you were asking about? Well, actually, I want to I want to remove the separation from creative and non-creative people. And, and I think this is what we're trying to achieve in this series of embodiment. It, it's not to say that creative work makes you a creative person. Creative work is just a manis, manifestation of creative thinking. But what I want to introduce and democratize and and um, share broadly is that living creatively is a, a, is a, almost a way of doing life well, if that makes sense. And you don't need to literally be producing paintings and illustrations and poetry to do life well. You can just try to exist creatively, become something, be in a state of becoming. Oh, so to create, to you is more than just the art. It's more of manifesting yourself. Yeah, it's, it's a mind state. It's, it's, a, it's a posture through which you explore the world and find yourself in the world. It's like, yeah, there's a, lot of, there's a lot of ways to objectify your existence. Like you can call yourself whatever profession you have. You can call yourself um, whatever relationships you have and whatever theories and religious uh, morality that you draw from. But there's also this thing of, about existing well that's you becoming and opening yourself up to evolving through a process. And that to me is creative living. Wow. That's interesting. Um, that's a very interesting, uh, like very, I feel, I feel it's very thoughtful for you to put it that way. Because, you know, like people think about creating and they just think about creating a craft. So within us, you know, it has made me think that actually as humans, we're actively creating our life. We actually are reforming our lives by being in that process of defining our purpose. Oh, no, that's, it's a, it's a very good thought to ponder on. Yeah, yeah. And where I want to make sure this is hitting home is that I don't want this just to be uh, musings and idealism. I want it to be embodied. I want you to think beyond this being a cute idea and like literally as you leave this call today, you're going to get up and think about how am I creating myself in this moment? How am I living purposefully? Because look, look around us, look at all the uh, tensions and dissensions in the world. People are, are trying to um, throw their purpose on you. Like they're, they're trying to throw you in this, elaborate process of objectification really that's what racism is but what if we all started to adopt this mentality of living creatively 
like being beyond the labels and confinements and categories that we found ourselves situated in. <laughs> I didn't ask a question there at all. I'm just really just taking this as a soapbox moment. Um, so anyone, anyone who wants to chime in, please do. I, Steph, I was gonna, I, I mean, I'm gonna pass the mic right back to you, but um, <laughs> do you think that there is, um, do you think that there's creativity without purpose? Um, I'm gonna say no to stay on brand right now. <laughs> um, and because there, there, there's something you're pulling from or pulling towards when you engage in creativity. And I think that there is the purpose. Like that's the governing principle. And I, I use principle in a very loose and light way. It's not, it's not something that you can write down in a credence or in a law. It's, it's kind of like a, a motion or a moving, a pulling um, of sorts. And I think that there is purpose. I had a second question. It was that, do you think that there are parts of the world that can't exist within those, you know, you're saying creativity, mm. as a remedy. are there parts of the world that just can't sustain with creativity as a remedy? Oh, that is a brilliant question. Is there privilege involved in this? And a hundred thousand percent, there is heavy amounts of privilege. Some people can live much more creatively than others, but I don't, I'm not willing to hold, however true or wrong, I'm not willing to hold the belief that uh, there is a person who has no level of of optionality towards creative living, and so that comes at many in many forms. It could be perspective shifting. It could be literally changing your methodology. It could be um, how you engage and see matter and existence in and of itself. But I think the point here being is that we're not fixed. Not even if you're in chains within. Uh, a slave system that you are fixed to that thing, that objectification process in which you found yourself. And what about society rather than on a personal level? Are there parts of society that, that we can't just ascribe or prescribe, I guess, you know, creativity as a remedy to? Do we need rigid bounds where creativity doesn't have room to, to, to grow and flourish? All those places we need to burn down. This is not kidding. Um, <laughs> I love it. <laughs> But no, I do believe I do believe in the systems and functions approach to uh, communal and social living. I do believe that there are some institutions that must exist. We must fi find ourselves in those institutions. But those institutions themselves must not stay fixed because they are, after all, social processes. And within those, we must be constantly looking towards our evolution and in our becoming, because once they become fixed, they become oppressive. Mm -hmm. so. <laughs> we went somewhere. <laughs> I'm just going to do a quick time check because it is eight. Um, if if you if this has been too long for you, please feel free to bow out. Um, we appreciate you listening to this ridiculous chat thus far. Um, I do think we're going somewhere, but um, if you want to stay on, please do. I'm happy to keep the conversation flowing because I think we're getting uh, somewhere very good, actually. Um, Do you think that there's an element of madness um, involved in uh, um, the creative process? Is this question for me? Anybody? I want to say yes. Um, and, and again, I think it, it really depends on what we're defining as certain, like what is madness, right? Like me mm -hmm. being eccentric, am I mad for like mm -hmm. literally rejecting your frame and saying, no, this is, this is not something I believe in and choosing something that's never been done. Um, and I, well, yeah, I would, I would say it depends on who is the person calling the other individual mad, mm. right? Yes. Uh, because they could be completely sane. Do you know, does it make sense? Like if I went to Japan in 1600s, like somehow, 
being in North America, we fashioned a boat together and we arrived and we saw, we, we arrived there and we're like, this is wild. What are you guys doing? You guys do things completely different than we do. And all the frames and the communities that they've created are completely different than ours. And we would, because of how we've grown up, we would have said, none of these things would work for us. This is crazy. You can't do any of these things. Um, which is why I think, I, I think it really depends on the individual and the individuals, how open they are to possibilities. Because if, you can't, if you can't see that you can choose a different frame or choose a different way of thinking, then you are stuck and you are fixed. And now you can no longer, it's impossible. It's impossible to generate anything new because you are stuck there. And so I think you, like you said, I think you have to be a bit crazy. You have to be a bit nuts. <laughs> yeah, at, at the very least, you have to be comfortable with uncertainty. Yeah. But but um, but I think um, I don't know if everybody is like that. I don't know if everybody is quite um, comfortable with uncertainty, or or if everybody is to some degree comfortable with uncertainty. I don't know how much. I, I'm I'm pretty sure that some people can take more uncertainty than than others. You know, so too much uncertainty can literally have um, disastrous effects effects on the body. So I'm wondering if it if it is um if we would be a little bit irresponsible to encourage all people to live creatively. So I have a quick response to that um, before I <laughs> open up space for other people to chime in and say that comfort is you, what you're assuming in that is like comfort is a high ideal, and I think that as an idea is a uniquely modern North American idea like we're moving towards comfort. And I think that feels very right because it's been widely shared, but I'm not sure there's any way of objectively verifying the truth of that. I, I do think there's real um, meaning to moving in a direction that isn't comfortable. Mm -hmm. How do you, yeah. the question, like how do you, how, how do you, convey that to people in a way that, you know, it's it's your perspective, it's widely shared, but it isn't entirely shared. I think that's kind of where, Mark, what you were saying. Mm. Oh. Oh, yeah, okay. <laughs> sure. <laughs> sure. It, it, um, yes, yeah, I do agree that comfort, I think, is, um, is a modern ideal. Certainly, is a modern idea from what I understand. Um, but but um, but I'm just wondering how much comfort, how much comfort does it require to be, um, or how uncomfortable do you have to be, in order to exist in this creative modality as we lay out? And I'm wondering, um, I'm wondering if it can actually drive some people crazy. I'm wondering if too much creativity is, you know, is maddening. I guess, are you likening that to the feeling of uncertainty? Um, am I likening it to, to what? The feeling of uncertainty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so, so the thing is, it's, it's, it's it's all right. So from what I understand, they used to when when they were initiating young men, you know, or, or like initiating boys into manhood in some um, ancient societies. What they used to do is they would put them in caves, you know, and um, they would leave them there for three or four days in order for them to get in contact with their subconscious. And throughout that process, some of the kids came back mad, and the, the ones that did not come back crazy were deemed fit for manhood and um, reintroduced in society as, you know, responsible, responsibility bearing members of that society. So I, I'm wondering if that's the type of creative, creativity that we're talking about, where when one looks into oneself and um, develops a relationship with one's subconscious and all the terrible things that lie beneath the surface of who we actually think we are. And um, 
you know, in a way to have us pull from that and develop ourselves anew and um, create ourselves, so to speak. And um, I'm wondering if that process is, if that process can be maddening for some people. Or is it, is it the case that I'm describing something totally different than what we're talking about in this conversation? So I want to build on that thought and push it towards Sharia so he can bring her back into the conversation. Because I, I think you're introducing something that's very fair and valid, but I'd, I would respond to it in a way that is kind of the point here where that form of creativity is still quite um, large, high flown and abstract. It, it, it almost hovers above our head. I think there's a level of living creatively that's discreet, uh, subtle, and much smaller, like task oriented on the day to day. So I'll give an example. Like sometimes um, there are foods where I, f I wanna eat with a spoon instead of a fork. And it's not for any um, grand purpose uh, other than just opening myself or making myself available to the option of doing something differently. And this is the sort of mentality that I think we can introduce at the very low level. Like just open yourself up to the idea. You don't need a journey into madness. Like you don't need to create um, the Sistine's Chapel, but you certainly can think about why you are fixed with wearing red shoes on a Wednesday. Yeah. So the, the question actually I want to put in Chinra's court is what do, what do you think are some things we can do day to day to live more like how you do where we're creating ourselves actively? Mm -hmm. Can I say something regarding his then also say about? Of course, of course. Um, you know, like for the kind of creativity he was talking about, right? I feel like as though why it will drive to madness is because they're imposing their purpose on the on the on the on those kids. And I feel like as though the type of creative living that we've been talking about, you know, it's all about process, making mistakes and being able to shape your life. And that's why it's quite different from that form of the research, you know, like what they did, because they were actively, they didn't let them um, define their purpose. You're telling someone that you have to do this and you have to touch in inward, you know, like purpose takes time. It, it's not, it doesn't have a set time. I could discover my purpose when I'm 80. And that doesn't mean that I didn't start discovering it when I was 20 to get I could have started but you know like I just hit that right one or, or, the, or the hierarchy of where you know like the full-blown purpose at my later age you know and that doesn't mean I didn't live a fulfilled life so I, I feel like as though the active of um, the kind of creative process that we've been talking about gives room for you defining it defining your purpose yourself you being able to make mistakes you being able to define what purpose is for you and you being able to, um, you know, like have influences that you want shape it for you. Because again, we cannot police purpose because we come from different cultures. Um, what purpose can mean, you know, like a good purpose could mean for you could mean something else for a tribe in my country or a tribe in another place. So it's like different things actively shape that. But those people in that research, they were trying to put into those people's head. And that's why it drove them to madness because they were forcing them to do something their mental state was not touching into. Mm. And that was all mad. And so, I mean, for that, you know, like for, for what you were saying and um, for your question, can you ask it again, please? I, yeah. <laughs> I was so deeply into this thought, I forgot. I can't really phase that one. That's such a brilliant answer. I always don't want to bring back the question. <laughs> But the question was, how can we show up in our day-to-day -day lives and live more like you do, where you, you've created such, you've created a world in front of you, basically. Like, it's not just um, your business, it's like um, the community around you, you know? How do, we, how do we make this something that it's not just powerhouses like you do, but it's something that the everyday person can do as well? Yeah, okay. So, I believe my birthday. It's <laughs> coming in me too. I'm you. so so sorry. <laughs> yeah, I do remember you. Is that our show? Yes. 
Look, we're having a discussion. Can I ask you? We're having a discussion. We discussion. No, can I have a discussion? <laughs> yeah, I'm Africa. That's my younger brother. Sorry. Siblings. Get them out. Please, I know it's the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, like another thing, something that everyone has to do is don't force yourself. Do not force yourself to, you know, like, oh, you're seeing this person is doing this. I have to map out. You have to let things flow. Mm. I feel we should write out the goals we want to achieve in life. And we need to figure out, you know, like, what do we have fun doing? How do we, everyone is different. Like, what do we like doing? Like, there has to be something you enjoy doing. So how can you craft that into being able to shape yourself or to do what you want to give the world? Like, what do you want to give the world? If they were to ask you right now, what do you want to put out to the world? What good thing, you know, like, do you want to put out to the world? And, like, what do you like doing? What's that thing that you love doing? So I feel like as if we can reflect on that and write it out and then try to form up something positive and do not force yourself to get do not force yourself because i again i believe in people you can make different mistakes but again don't let it derail where you're trying to go to there has to be a limit you can't just keep making endless mistakes and just oh well today i made a mistake tomorrow i know i'm gonna make another mistake and now you're not gonna feel anything so you have to give yourself room to be able to fail but then give yourself room to be able to learn from those from your failure and be able to do better do you get so you know just actively put out good into the world understand what good means for you and what, what can you do to make that good manifest into the world what 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 passion what you know like what's that thing like what's your passion and what can you do to manifest into the world when you do that you would come up with an active plan that would help you you know build a good community around you Beautifully said, once again. Can I push the question to Nadia and Evan as well? Uh, and if Mark comes back, from your eternal remedy work to your broader life work, what does, it, what does living creatively look like to you? How does it show up and what would you tell us we can do um, as a starting point? Well, while she was answering the question, I was trying to think about myself as well um, and how, just like how deep rooted or how simple it could be in just in terms of like simple choices throughout the day. Um, and I think I came, I came to, I think two or three themes, which are like choice. Like I, I can choose and I can make a decision to do something. And whether, just like you said, like not wear red shoes on Wednesday, you know, like I'm not confined to something, right? And then the next thing is um, not too, not in audacity, but more so like in belief, like I am capable or like I believe that I can do something. Like I have, um, I have impact and that I just think of the most, I don't want to say the most creative because they're really just people who believe something different would happen. That's like, you know, like of thousands of people, they just believe something different could happen. And I think you have to have that kind of thinking um, in your daily life, you know, just like, I don't know. I, I think about even approaching this project we created here um, and trying to create something new and just believing that it would be, different and people would like it you know my biggest my biggest um obstacle is that people are going to hate it and i ask myself well what if they loved it and like believe that what if they love this and who am i not to do it you know and i think those are some of the questions i ask myself um before i do anything because i think and my last point is creativity comes for me just like sharing my experiences in in whatever form it is you know and expressing myself in whichever way it is it, like my creativity could be like making rice 
like four different ways because like I just personally like have control of this rice and I express my life through this rice, right? And I think of any any time I've ever made food and I now I'm just thinking about the rice is like I I can choose to create a different I can choose to incorporate different ingredients into these things, you know, and impose my will on this rice <laughs> and if I, if it tastes terrible, like it's terrible, but like I am open to trying something new and not being confined to the choices that I, that I think are only readily available. Uh, yeah, I, I'm not too sure. That was like a little bit of a rambling, but I think that's where I am right now because they're all over the place. They're not. <laughs> It got somewhere. It got somewhere. It felt like it got somewhere. And I feel like someone could say it better than I would, but that's what it is. I feel you. Um, yeah, I think from my perspective, it might be a little different, but um, I think it's through mindfulness. And to me, I feel like when I apply mindfulness to what I'm doing, it's almost like a power up. Like I almost feel like I unlock parts of myself that I wouldn't. And I don't when I'm not fully pouring myself into and giving myself, you know, to, to the work that I'm actually doing. Um, I feel like those questions, um, you know, Evan, you're mentioning some of the questions that you ask yourself, you know, I feel like you've got to be really present and really in the moment and really aware, self-aware and aware of what you're doing to start to unlock those questions for yourself and start to unlock the reason behind why, you know, and, and you, you owe it to yourself. And I think you do your absolute best when, when, when that focus is there. So for me, like the day to day, um, I, I, I like to learn the different ways, um, you know, that I can be present and show up and, and be mindful, you know, and then, you know, uh, you're mentioning the, the iterative process of redefining your purpose. And I think when you're fully clear and fully aware is when you start to identify, you know, you, you identify when you do need to redefine your purpose and when you do need to make changes in your day to day, because you are so aware, right. We apply a, a lens of creativity and, and those things start to come in when your mind is clear and when your, your vision is clear. Oh, you added a layer to that and I'm so appreciative because it sounds, what you're saying, it sounds, it sounds like a practice and I think what you're touching on is perfect because I think what I was describing was like, it was effortless. It's kind of like, I'm just doing these things like naturally because I've been practicing. I've been practicing this, these thoughts, right? And trying to give this to somebody else, it, it may not be as easy to be in the moment and to be present to these things because one of my, I, I was going to say, um, I don't know if I completely agree with you because what if I just stumble upon something and I give a creative thought to somebody like a creative note on something Stefan said for a project. And he's like, Oh, I didn't think about that. And I'm like, I wasn't even, I wasn't even actively trying to be present, but I, but I'm in the process. I'm in the practice of being mindful, create uh, creatively, I guess. Right. And so I'm, it's, it's the state where I don't, you don't, or I don't think I always have to activate mind like to be thinking about, cause I've been doing it so often. So, but I can find my center if I continue to meditate on those things or to mm, activate mindfulness. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. No, I a hundred percent agree. I think that the, the point that I was bringing it into is how to, um, make changes in what to do in your day to day. And that's mm -hmm. something that we can do. Whereas you're talking about something that was natural and inherent to you, which is totally yeah. like yeah. you'll, you'll embody your creativity through things that are really inherent and unintentional. But I just mean to, to, to do something to say to yourself, I'm going to set out to introduce creativity in a greater way in, in, in my world. And the way that I do it is that mindfulness is some way that I can bring out and introduce my creativity throughout, throughout my life. Yeah, I agreed in a lot of words that seemed contradictory. <laughs> <laughs> no, Evan, why? <laughs> Mark, I'm going to turn the question to you. What, what have you learned from your creative practice, from your personal practice and development that you might want to share with us about how we can embody living creatively? I think you're on mute. Oh. Oh, Ooh, okay. Um, about living creatively. So, so for me, one of the, the most exciting things that I've um, 
that, that I've been lucky enough to stumble upon in my life's journey is the, um, the ability to hold two contradicting positions and to form a synthesis out of them. You know, um, being a good person versus being a, you know, absolute devil at sometimes being loving versus being hateful. Um, and um, I think, I think there's real, I think that there, there's real work to be done there and the work never stops, you know, needing to be done. And I think that's where the, um, that's where I get the most fruit out of, out of life, learning how to like balance myself, you know. And I think that's where the create that's where the creative process process comes in, you know. To to um, I guess we could like in that in that sense, our mm -hmm. life becomes an art. And um, I think yeah. So so I would say that for me, living creatively means watching out for spaces where I can like bring two contradictions together. Um, that is um, something that I would encourage anybody to do. Beautifully said <laughs> and masterfully done, all of you. I want to close the, um, the deliberate chat part of this by first saying what a blessing it is to have you in our space, Shinra. You, of course, did not disappoint. Brilliance at every toss and turn. We are, we are very appreciative of all your thoughts and additions and can't wait to work with you again and stay abreast of what you do and support you. Um, and the Eternal Remedy team continuing on this pathway of pure fire, pure uh, progression and, and revolutionary thinking. I think uh, if there's something that I've taken away from the series and especially in this conversation is that this, this internal evolution is not that far away. It isn't this like idea that we hold above ourselves anymore. It's like, again, an embodiment. And I, I, I hope we continue to preach that as a message that this is, it's, it's a journey to become yourself. And um, aside from what you'll glean from self-help books and philosophers and, and teachers, that there's, there's a deliberate practice about going about your life that allows you to internalize these, these, uh, thinkings into your work and, and into your relationships. So thank you once again. I want to open up the floor to questions from anyone else. Those of you who have dropped in, popped out, and who are still listening in um, for any of us, but especially Chinrea as we have her present, just to reflect on this discussion. Anybody? <laughs> Let me see. SU, Nicole, Franny, Cassandra, Abby. <laughs> Ask a question. Though. We just opened up so many cans of worms and it's so deep that everyone's like, okay, 8.30, what do I do? <laughs> Should we go deeper? <laughs> I dropped in late, so I don't wanna, um, make too much assumption but I always vibe with everyone and I'm grateful for the different perspectives that seem to like validate my thought you know like every guest that I partake in experiencing it's like oh yeah I do that or like me and Mark can talk every day for I don't know how many months, but he'll say something here and I'm like, oh yeah, I totally agree. But like, we're always at odds. Um, there is such a purpose, like particularly like I try to close down my, uh, my energy loops in like a serious way, like, um, I format how much energy I'm giving out to certain people, certain interactions, like within my day, but also like my food economy and like try not to waste and try to turn everything around. So it's interesting to break down those thoughts because I would not have thought of those things as 
part of my creativity. Like, I do notice that I am like more in a manic state where like traditional creativity flows. Like what I'm writing is when I'm at a computer with a million stuff to do and all I can think of is not the work that I need to get done. But um, that's not really a question. So I kind of like, I vibe in between where Evan and Nadia are both at like, there are some things that are effortless because I've been practicing them, you know, like an omelet or a recipe or making yourself food or cooking for the dog. And then there are other things that I feel like are so contrived, um, especially in my writing, I like feel paralyzed sometimes in that purpose. Like if I sit down to write, it's not going to happen. I just have to do all the other things that I've been practicing and just like wait for that moment to come. And there I am. Love it. Anyone else? I guess like I'll just ask my last final question. Um, Shanira, if you were to leave us with one thought as we, you know, drift off tonight and we're thinking about, you know, your final words on purpose, what would it be that you would want us to be thinking? I would want you to, um, I would want you to define purpose by yourself. You shouldn't box yourself, but then as you define it, just make sure it's purposeful in the sense of it achieving a purpose, kind of redundant, but like <laughs> <laughs> because you know like I don't want people to box themselves into tradition or into a convention of what your society defines purpose to be you know like you need to be you need to have free will with your bringing your purpose your right to get to be able to take that drive that makes you achieve things so I will tell you to be mindful of it do you understand? so it doesn't derail you into a negative that it could push you into the positive side. You understand? Because again, when you have too much free will, that's where things can actually go into the negative side. Because now you start manifesting things that you shouldn't manifest. Do you get? So you should be mindful of it and you should be unconventional. You don't have to do what A did or B did. No, you could actually do what, you could shape it yourself. It could be you could go a non-traditional route. You don't have to do what everyone is doing. You could be unique in it, and that's what makes your purpose, because it's you. Ultimately, your, person, your purpose is who you are, and we are not the same. I don't have another chinyere that is me in this world, and that's why my purpose is unique. Even though B can be manifesting something in that line, but it's still unique to me. The way I'll go about it and the way my life would manifest it is still different. There's still that uniqueness in it, even though the world might see a similarity between them, but it's this, there's still a unique DNA that it breeds. So just be mindful of it, but also, you know, be unconventional. Don't box yourself in. Don't put a time, you know, too much. Don't try to pressure yourself. You know, yeah, be mindful of the milestones. I'll tell you that. But, you know, don't try to pressure yourself to, to make something because then you might actually lose it all. So don't be afraid to fail, but always remember to learn from those failures and bounce back. To with the mindset to win. Super solid answer. I, I love one point that you brought up and I'm surprised we hadn't touched on it, which is um, discipline when it comes to purpose uh, and that intersection. So yeah, that was, um, that was I think, the, the kind of one light, definitely light bulb that, that I took from that. I think uh, SU has a question for everybody. Is there a time in your life when you didn't have a, a, a clear sense of purpose and how did you move from that state to a more purposeful one? Uh, I'll speak on that quickly. Um, I, I, I don't recall a time where I was completely without purpose, but I would say much a much less full sense of it. And the progress there had to do a lot with undoing. You know, we spoke about that a bit in yesterday's chat. Like, um, I, I feel myself tied at times to so many long-standing teachings and learnings and ideals that weren't my own. And uh, 
I realize that I ultimately lack direction when I'm following an, another direction. I, I, I feel a sense of lack of directionality when I'm following someone else's direction, which goes back to the question of is, um, is success without purpose failure? And I think it is a sense, it, it's, a, it's a very covert and sophisticated form of failure because I don't feel successful. That's the key there. And uh, so what, what I learned in the undoing process is how to tap into my deeper feelings, my deeper needs that weren't doctored or imposed upon me, but were earned throughout my life. Um, um, for me, I would say, yes, there was, a, there was a time in my life when I did not have a clear sense of purpose. And um, as for how I moved to a more purposeful state, I would have to say that I don't know, neither can I take full, um, I can't, I can't really say that it was on me. It was just like, um, like something, something unfortunate, well, not necessarily unfortunate happened, but like, let's say that um, something happened that caused me to see things differently in my environment. And um, through those processes, I move, gradually moved to a more purposeful state. Most of those events were a little bit unfortunate, like let's say a breakup or something like that. And um, so like essentially you, my world fell, fell apart and I had to build a new world out of the ashes of my old world, essentially. And that's how I gradually moved to a more purposeful state. So I can't really, say that I was the, 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 the uh, I was instrumental in like my life becoming purposeful. Yeah, I feel that. I can give an example. Um, I feel like I've just really exited that purposefulness stage. Um, some of you may know, and I was a professional soccer player. And so like from five, from like out of the womb, I knew what I was gonna do. And like, I did it. Like, and every day, that's what it was. There was no other thoughts. There was no other goals. It was very clear in one direction. And then at 25, it kind of ended, but not in a crescendo, but more so abruptly and just blah and couldn't go back and so i feel like a combination between stefan and mark and how i got out was i had to let go of what i what success was told to me like i had to let go of the frame of possibilities that i've been given um and saw that I am, per not that there are possibilities out there, but like I am capable of those things, that I can go and change my course and recreate who I am completely from scratch today. And that I do not have to be this person or this, this, this culmination of all of these skills. I can choose something completely new and I, that took a lot because I, that was my identity. You have to abandon an identity you had. Um, and I think we put so much meaning behind our own identities that we create for ourselves because it's who we are. Um, but again, I had, to, I had to realize that I can expand that identity. I can expand and that I can choose and choose a different frame or expand the current frame I have. And it feels good because now I can, I, I'm in these conversations and I feel I'm in a completely different field that I would ever have done. I, or like this is a hobby that I would never have even thought about um, diving into um, because it wasn't, it wasn't, um, it wasn't something that people in athletics would do. You don't dabble in these conversations even trying to have conversations with my friends that are in athletics about these conversations is like pulling teeth 
at times because they don't, I don't want to, I don't want to speak for them, but it seems that there's a lack of awareness or personal awareness or imagine, uh, imagination when it comes to these things. So I have to start with myself and look inward for myself and I'm, learn a lot of things and believe that something new was possible for me outside of the destiny that I created however many years ago. I love it. Yeah, I, Junior, I, want, I would want to let you go ahead before I, I speak on anything. Wait, I didn't hear what you said. Oh, I just said I would want you to go ahead if you've got something to say before me. Oh, no, no, it's fine. Do, you're all good. So I guess yeah, for the on the uh, on the idea of um, you know a point where I I didn't feel like I had purpose. I I feel like um, contrary to like some of the you know a lot of the great things I can say about my upbringing, um, I didn't feel as though my parents forced any type of ideal on me where I would draw purpose from in those um, you know early years. Um, so I found it myself in, in, you know, in the principles and the values that were instilled in me. And I, I wanted to work in some sort of social field, um, you know, working with people. And my fall off and loss of purpose came with um, the education system failing me in a couple of different ways over a couple of different years. And um, at that point, I, I lost all sense of purpose. If I wasn't going to school to become an educator, if I wasn't going to be out helping children, um, I lost my purpose entirely. What, what else was I going to do? Um, and, and I think for me, it was being wrong and being, again, not being mindful of where I wanted to go with, you know, wh like what my purpose was, not paying attention to the fact that I was just flowing through without purpose. Um, you know, it wasn't until I, I, I started to take a grip and really start to take inventory of my life and, um, you know, was able to, to, to look really thoughtfully and look really mindfully into what I was doing and why, um, and then kind of reverse engineer to start filling in the, the actions that I should be taking if I want to achieve this purpose that I've had. I should have never lost my purpose with, you know, my education feeling me in the way that it did. But um, I think I've come to this complete 360 now where I'm back at this purpose of, of the same, you know, where I was. And it, it was just taking a matter of, of looking deeply and understanding why I lost it to begin with and, and asking myself, why can't I have that back? Masterful, masterful. Thank you all for your responses. This is elevated to a place that I couldn't imagine it going. And I'm grateful for all of you, and especially you, Chinmaya, for putting so much thought and insight and reflection into our space that we simply couldn't have got from anywhere else. And in that vein, is there anything you would plug that you're working on, that you've worked on, that we can fall into your universe a bit <laughs> i'm sorry well you can follow um wait is it like for you guys to be able to check it out or just me talking about it all of the above oh um yeah the we have a new um collection coming out with my um clothing brand it's called dashiki pride and um you can check us out on instagram and then, or the website, www.dashibibrae.com. And then I'm working on a book. And, um, you know, with that book, it's more, you know, it has a lot to do with, you know, like injustice regarding our gender and, uh, you know, feminism. And also, it could also take a shape, shape with me being able to form my identity or being able to talk about it in a, in a, in a in in a perspective from a woman, and um, you know, like I've, it's it's it's. I believe in it that it's going to be a good book to be able to, you know, add some type of thoughts to people's mind. And also, I have uh, an album that I'll work on, and the name of it it's gonna call that I mean be called Epiphany. So it's a project, it's not even an album for me. I don't see it just like a musical album. It's like, it follows in the process of me being able to define my identity. So like I had an epiphany. So I have to still 
let people know from you know my voice of where I'm coming from, how everything formed, like this whole purpose, how the whole thing formed. So I'm also playing it in a musical body. So you can follow me on Chinyero Gope. That's where I have all my like craft and creative. So if you guys check out literally any, if not all of the stuff she does, you'd be surprised with how a human being can accomplish all that within a <laughs> lifetime, much less as young as you are. It's, it literally blows my mind. And it's all excellent A quality stuff. In fact, I need to get me one of the Dashiki Pride masks. I've been looking at okay. those. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. You could um, let me know, then I can figure out where to send you one. Okay, done, done deal. They're beautiful, gorgeous. Please check those out. I put the link in the chat here. But this has been a long chat. I want to give you guys your life back on a Sunday evening. I can't tell you again how grateful I am for this conversation and the space for indulging me. I, you know, for those of you who have experienced conversations before, will know that there's some ray of substance amongst the convoluted and the noisy and the uh, boisterous so i hope we got there eventually let me close on saying tuesday we're at this again we're having another chat led by master evan over there um so we're, we're continuing the series for this week on the conversation of purpose again i dare any of you to deliver a better session um and if you can i'll be looking forward to it but other than that Thank you all for being here, and I think we can close on this note. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Peace, 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 peace. So at Evan. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Evan. How was my birthday? <laughs> oh, happy birthday. Happy belated birthday. Thanks. Okay. And all together, singing. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my god, okay, good night guys. It's good night, good night, good night. Good night. <laughs> oh my.